Hey everyone, welcome to Cornerstone Fellowship Church Online. I'm glad that you're here and let me start things off by wishing a happy 244th birthday to my adopted homeland, America. Are you looking great? If you are new to Cornerstone, welcome. My name is Christian and I serve as the online campus pastor. It's a great week to become part of church because this week at Cornerstone, we are starting a brand new series called Anchored. Our lead pastor, Steve Matson is here to walk us through a bunch of scriptures that highlight that in the midst of these exceptional times, we can find hope and assurance. So get your Bible or pull up your favorite Bible app uh, because you're gonna uh, need it today. Anchor of my soul Turn into revival. Believe. 
Hello, church family, thank you for joining us today. This weekend, we celebrate the 4th of July, where we take time to commemorate our country's independence. One of my kids' favorite things to do on this holiday is to light hand sparklers and to make cool designs in the concrete. Now, this stresses me out because they're basically holding fire, but they absolutely love it. And then, of course, my favorite thing to do is to eat some delicious barbecue. But this year, if I'm honest, the 4th of July, it feels different. 
there's no baseball games happening. And I'm not even a huge baseball fan, but I miss the background noise of the ball hitting off the bat and the crowd cheering on TV. This year, Independence Day feels different because we continue to face uncertainty and crisis in our country and world. But even though this year is different, this weekend as Christians, we come together united to celebrate our country's independence and each sacrifice that was made to achieve that, but we also get to celebrate our freedom in heaven. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we know that no matter what comes against us, both big and small, we have freedom in Jesus that will never be shaken. So let's take some time this weekend to enjoy coming together with family and friends as we celebrate freedom and victory. Now, as we celebrate these freedoms this weekend, I wanna share two stories that are affecting our neighbors, both locally and globally. Many of you are familiar with the crisis that is happening in Lebanon. This country is enduring extreme hardships with 50% of their population unemployed and living in severe poverty. The living conditions have become so harsh that many in Lebanon are fleeing the country, including Christians that have begun incredible work within that country. Now, our outreach department has been staying in close communication with a faithful pastor living in Beirut, who despite the difficult circumstances, has chosen to stay and care for those in need and to bring hope to Christians in his community. But it's becoming more and more difficult for him to do this on his own. Now, thankfully through our COVID fund that many of you have contributed towards, our church was able to send Pastor George $5,000, which more than triples when converted into Lebanese currency. And this helps his efforts in feeding families without food and to provide hope that God sees and hears the cries of his children. And locally, as hunger needs rise in our own communities, Cornerstone is continuing to partner with all five of our campuses to help alleviate hunger in the East Bay. We wanna thank Jersey's Restaurant personally for partnering with us to provide more than 100 meals a week for homeless in Livermore and Hayward. This food, it not only supplies needed nutrients, but it also gives a sense of value and dignity for those who receive this meal. Now with that said, I wanna thank you, church, for being a church that provides incredible opportunity for our neighbors. Each of your gifts, both small and large, give courage and support to those who greatly need it. Now, if you would like to join with us financially or continue to give to the vision and mission of Cornerstone, you can do that online right now. And let's continue to partner together to share the love of Jesus. Well, today, Pastor Steve Matson kicks off our new series, Anchored. During this season, many of you may be feeling like you're tossed around with the different trials coming against you. And perhaps you have a sense of hopelessness that is just settling in. Well, today's message will provide us an anchor that each of our souls are craving in the midst of this time. So friends, let's lean in today and let Jesus bring us hope as we receive and hear the Word of God. Hey church, I am stoked about this series for the month of July where we're going to be focusing on one biblical word, the word hope. And this is something we all need as we start the second half of this amazing year, 2020, especially on the 4th of July weekend, which is normally a huge American holiday. And it just feels kind of, I don't know, not much different than last weekend. And these are the summer months when we normally wrap things up at work and pack the car and, and head out for a nice vacation, maybe the beach. I was missing the beach last week, uh, remembering boogie boarding a few summers back. Boogie boarding, also known as surfing for sissies. Uh, but we were having a great time out there uh, on Santa Cruz Beach, right there by the boardwalk. The waves were big enough to give us some nice long rides. But the longer you're out there, the more the current carries you south. And so you have to check from time to time as to how far down you've gone, gone so you can work your way back. And I, I was doing that during, uh, and, and, and looking away from the waves, which they tell you never to do, and I got hit by a huge wave, which just broke right behind me, actually on top of me, sending me tumbling uh, down end over end. And by the time I figured out bottom from top, I came up, I was sputtering and coughing and choking and 
Uh, I had banged up my knee pretty bad, but before I could recover, another wave hit me, and once again, I was spinning down uh, and around on the seafloor, hitting rocks and sand, and uh, that second wave was all it took for me to head for the shore to recover. Well, 2020 has kind of felt like that, uh, where we're getting hit by waves that uh, leave you little time to get your head above the water and get your feet on solid ground. Like this last week when the county was just relaxing the rules and then the COVID-19 numbers shot back up. Well, you know, there's some good things too. There's fashion statements. I mean, who knew that the number one fashion statement of the summer would be face masks? But you don't have to buy an expensive one like this. You can make one at home uh, like this person did. What do you think of this one? How about this one? <laughs> you like this one? Yeah, you can even go out with an outfit that helps remind people to socially distance. Well, it's been crazy out there and with no end in sight. Parents, did you fill out your school survey asking you how many days each week you wanted to homeschool this year? Are you kidding me? It's no wonder we're grumpy. When the highlight of our day is spending an extra 15 minutes in the bathroom or, or getting appetizers with our DoorDash order, wow. And uh, is it just me or are all of you like tired at like 8.30 at night? What's happening to us? Well, I'm gonna stop whining and start working on what we're gonna work on all month because we can't fix COVID-19 and it doesn't seem to be easing off, but we can do so much work on our spirits, on our attitudes, on our minds, allowing God's Holy Spirit to encourage us. So every weekend this month, we're gonna open our Bibles and allow God to use these promises to replenish our reservoir of hope. As we wait on the Lord, in order to renew our strength. The Bible was written for times like these. The entire book from start to finish is packed with hope, written by people, written about people who were severely tested. Abraham, Joseph, Hannah, David, Esther, Nehemiah, so many of our heroes of the faith suffered long trials and impossible challenges that threatened to rob them of any hope, yet they endured. And what was written of them rings true for us as we endure our trials. The Bible is such a unique resource for us in times like these because it doesn't just educate our minds, it hydrates our souls. Believers are wise to drink from these wells to encourage our hearts. And this month, our Cornerstone preachers are going to lead us in sermons packed with Scripture. Have your Bibles ready and pen and paper nearby. And our worship team will offer extended sets of songs uh, uh, reminding us of all that we have in Christ. Don't miss the music. The music will give us as much of a lift as the preaching. This month, we're going to offer you biblical hope. Let's do that now. Let's open our Bibles and Bibles apps, Bible apps, there it is, to the Old Testament book of Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40 verse 28 starts with a question. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. I'll stop there for a minute because that's a good reminder uh, that as weary as we are, God isn't tired at all. He's not worn down by the present circumstance like we are. He doesn't wake up every morning and sigh, wondering if today will be very different than yesterday. No, he sees yesterday, he sees today, and he sees tomorrow all at the same time. And guess what? He has a plan. Yeah, 
a plan that for some reason included a worldwide timeout. What is he doing? I wish I understood it. But Isaiah says no one can. See it, see it there? Look at the end of verse 28. No one can fathom his understanding. But everyone who calls upon him can tap into fresh strength. Verse 29, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even young people grow tired and weary. Young people stumble and fall. Isaiah says, even the kids are worn out. You know, his original audience was another group who were also confined. The Jews had been in Babylonian captivity for years, and no doubt they were asking, when will this all end? But instead of answering their question, the prophet makes a promise to that weary generation that God would give them fresh legs. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Now, I'm not sure that's what they wanted to hear. They wanted rescue from the trial, and God gave them strength for the trial. They were hoping for, you know, some better circumstances soon. But God said, wait, trust me, and let me renew your strength. Verse 31, those who hope in the Lord, those who wait on the Lord, will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. All right, let's break that down. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. This is a promise, a promise for anyone who chooses to hope in God, to put faith in God, and wait expectantly, believing that the direct result of hoping in the Lord will be renewed strength. I received energy coming directly from God. Do you need some of that today? Well, you just heard how to get it. Those who hope in the Lord get it. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar like, uh, like eagles. Now, I just read this one um, uh, th about Isaiah's eagles, and I went out to play golf this week. I got to tell you, it was wonderful. Not my golf game. My golf game is the same as it always was. But just getting out there. And because I had read about Isaiah's eagles, I noticed this beautiful red-tailed hawk and these huge black vultures gliding effortlessly on the updrafts along the top of the ridges. These powerful birds were not even flapping their wings. They just stretched them out, allowing the wind currents to lift them up. It was so cool. And, and, and I was actually envious of them. As I watched them soar, the Lord spoke to me. Steve, he said, you see those birds? I want to take you to a similar place, to where the wind of my Holy Spirit can carry you above all of this. Just let go of your burden and let me lift you. Let me renew your strength. Hope in me. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Hope, hope in the Lord. We're going to be keying on this word all month, so let's define it. What is hope? Well, you know, biblical hope is much different than the word we commonly use. Uh, when we use this word in, in everyday language, it's often the opposite of biblical hope. Uh, it's an uncertain hope. Uh, I hope I don't lose my job. I hope my family stays healthy. I hope things can go back to normal sometime soon. When we use the word hope like that, what we're saying is, I wish this would happen, but it's out of my control and it might not happen. Well, that is very different than the biblical definition of hope because biblical hope is so much more than human wishful thinking. It's more than us daydreaming a better scenario. Biblical hope is the believer's confident expectation the assurance that God will work things together for our good. So when the Bible says, put your hope in God, when the Bible says, build on this rock, when the Bible says, anchor your soul to this hope, it is saying so much more than cross your fingers or knock on wood. That's what the world does. 
But we are birds of a different feather. Our hope lifts us up on invisible currents where we spread our wings and ride the updrafts with very little effort. We are actually resting as we soar. You can't see the wind holding us up, but it's surely, most definitely there. We soar with a spiritual certainty that surpasses even a logical certainty. Biblical hope includes logical certainty, but it doesn't require it. Let me explain. A person can reasonably, logically assume that if God has come through for them in the past, uh, he will do it again in the future. A person could reasonably assume that God could fix things. That's also logical. But biblical hope takes it much further. Our logic, our hope does not say God could fix this. Our hope says God will fix this. He will make things right. Even if we have no idea how or when he is going to do that, he is going to do it. Biblical hope is when we place complete confidence in God's promises before seeing any tangible evidence. It's what the writer of the New Testament book of Hebrews laid out in chapter 11, where he said, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Friends, that doesn't even make sense, but let's learn it together. Say it out loud with me. Faith is, wait, say it out loud with me. Come on. Faith is, you say it. All right, good. All right, look at the word sure and the word certain. These are powerful words. Uh, there's no ambiguity in, 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 in either of these words. And according to this definition of faith, we are certain God will, will move before there is any evidence of motion. We see it before we see it. You know, Isaiah said a lot of big things. Uh, he once said something so amazing that the Apostle Paul quoted him when he wrote his letter to the believers in Corinth. Paul writes, No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. Biblical hope takes us right there into the realm of the unseen, the invisible, and the unknown, where our eyes are open and we see things we should not be able to see. It's when we believe him before it makes any sense to believe him. You remember it was Thomas who said, guys, you saw the resurrected Christ, but I wasn't there. I didn't see him. So unless I see Jesus with my own eyes, unless I touch him with my own hands, I won't believe you. So Christ set up the meeting about a week later. Okay, Thomas, he said, come here and see. Reach out and touch. Thomas did, and he declared his faith in Jesus. And then Jesus said, I do want you, as a matter of fact, all of you, to grow in your faith to the point where you believe things before you see them. All right, back to Paul, who goes on in that same letter to the Corinthians to say that the only way we can ever get to this level of faith is to receive it from God. It is beyond human ability to trust fully in God. Even our faith itself is a gift from God. We have received the Spirit who is from God, Paul writes, so that then and only then we may understand what God has freely given us, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truth in spiritual words. We have the mind of Christ. Wow, and that is exactly what I ever prayed that you would receive today. Beyond anything that I could teach you, that you would receive faith, that you would be given hope by God himself. Do this with me. Open your hands right now. As you open your hands, open your heart and receive hope directly from the Holy Spirit of God. Ask Him to strengthen your faith today. Ask Him to refill your soul's 
reservoir with fresh hope. All right, look at that last phrase again where Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. Friends, your brain may be tired. Your mind may be weary. You cannot know what's going to happen, but you do know who knows. And Paul says, you have him there with you. You can depend on Christ's thoughts. You have the mind of Christ with you. And the mind of Christ fuels your hope because Christ is your hope. As Paul wrote in his letter to the Colossian believers, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Hey, stop. Do you actually believe that? That you possess Christ? That you already have him? His mind? His intelligence? His plan? His power? His comfort? Do you actually believe that he is there with you today? Well, if you do, then speak to him. Breathe in. Ask him to replace your weary and uncertain thoughts with with his strong and certain thoughts. If you feel weary today, then hear Christ's voice saying to you, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take your yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Friend, if, you're, if your burden feels heavy, maybe it's because it isn't your burden to carry. Maybe you've been trying to do God's work for him. Maybe you've always been the, the, the strong one in the family, the one everyone looks to for answers. But you've run out of answers. Let go of it. Let Jesus be the head of your home. Let Jesus make the plan. Let Jesus take that burden. Give it to him now. All right, one more thought before we pray. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11 instructs us to make our hope sure. Make our hope sure. Well, this picture is a powerful picture, um, something I would never do. Uh, but the image we get is of a rock climber high above the valley floor, hammering a piton deep into a crack and then testing it before putting their full weight on it. That piton has to hold that climber. It cannot fail. In the same way, as we follow the Lord year after year, trial after trial, we develop greater faith as we climb. We learn how to anchor ourselves into Him and then to trust that anchor. Our faith literally is what holds us safe and secure to the point that we can rest peacefully when others would be panicked. Hmm. This picture is what I have prayed for all of us as we rest tonight. Yeah, we still got some climbing to do. Um, The trial is a long one but we have anchored ourselves in Him, and He is holding us secure. Back in 2019, whenever we would preach each weekend, we did so knowing that a certain percentage of our congregation were in a trial. But now, in 2020, it's all of us at the same time. All of us, all over the world, are in the same trial. There are rarely times in human history when everyone in the world was experiencing the same storm. The last time this happened was before I was born. It was World War II, which enveloped the whole world. Before that, it was World War I and the Spanish flu. And like then, the whole world is again groaning under the strain. So this year, like no other year in our life, the church must step up with a message of hope, a hope found in Christ, the secure conviction that Christ can be trusted, and that his word is true. It starts with you allowing the Holy Spirit to refill your reservoir of hope. But it doesn't end there with you. Once God renews your strength, your neighbors need it too. Your literal neighbors next door, your social media neighbors, 
your coworkers on Zoom, your friend who's afraid to leave her home, that lady at the store who seems frightened that someone might touch her. There's a lot of fear out there. It's time for us to start preaching faith. So let me pray for each of you preachers, every one of you, that God will give you a fresh message of hope. Let me pray for you now. Father, I have felt your Holy Spirit here as I have preached. And my hope, my desire is that every person who has participated in this service today has also experienced a fresh touch of your Holy Spirit. Father, I ask you to replace uh, empty, dry, weary, lonely, hopeless thoughts with your word and your promises, and your presence. Jesus, I think of that person sitting alone today, watching, and I pray that they would feel the fellowship of your Spirit, and they would know that we haven't forgotten them. I pray for the the group that's sitting together, the family or friends that have gathered for a watch party, and I pray that each one of them would be an encouragement to the other. I pray that as you encourage us, we would encourage each other. Lord, you haven't told us when this trial will end, but you have told us that you can strengthen us for the trial. And so we're going to receive that now in Christ's name. Amen. Now let me bless you. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe in him so that you may overflow with hope By the power of the Holy Spirit, I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for being here today. Our whole team is praying that this is what you needed to hear today. Uh, It's certainly what I needed to hear. And here's the next step for us. Let's look up our favorite stories in the Old Testament part of the Bible of people that had to hold on to hope. And then let's read those stories with our family or friends. Our study guides and daily steps can help with that. Check them out on our website, cornerstoneweb.org. All right, that's it. Join us again next week as Clint Rutledge from our Brentwood campus teaches us from the book of James, who writes that we should actually consider it pure joy when we face trials. I'm going to need to hear that. What about you? I love you. I'm praying for you. Hope to see you again next time.